At this time, uh, Jonathan is going to bring to us our tithe and offerings. A special ministry is being spotlighted today. Jonathan, you want to tell us a little bit about AWR? Yep. Who knows what AWR is? Yeah, a few of you do. Adventist World Radio. What is unique about Adventist World Radio? It can get through hostile governments, right? So Adventist World Radio is heard throughout the world, you know, places like China, Bangladesh, Sudan, other areas of Africa, all around the world, in over 100 languages. So folks can hear it in their native tongue. And it, uh, to me, is one of the great frontline ministries that our church has. Uh, just a quick little story. Uh, a fellow left his home country of Ethiopia and looked for work. He ended up uh, herding camels, 200 camels in a herd. Where do camels hang out? Not around people, in the middle of the desert. And so he found himself out there weeks at a time, by himself, no human interaction, and his shortwave radio. And he came across in his native tongue, Adventist World Radio. And after listening to it for weeks, he decided he wanted to give his heart to Jesus. He wanted to be baptized. Ultimately, the government, you know, made everybody leave. And so when he went back home, he found uh, the, the folks doing Adventist World Radio out of Ethiopia and got baptized. Uh, this, is, this is just an example of we don't send too many missionaries to the middle of the desert to talk to the camel herdsmen. Uh, this is happening all over the world. So Adventist World Radio is a, is a wonderful ministry, and that is uh, today what our loose offering goes to. Uh, we do always have a special emphasis offering, so if you want to put it in the, um, in the, uh, in the envelope and just mark, mark it as special emphasis or evangelism, it's local evangelism. And we do have this series coming up. And, Pastor, what's the, what's the church's responsibility, the portion of the budget for this series? So thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars we're looking to raise to cover our evangelistic es ex uh, um, effort this spring, which is not far away. How many weeks? Three weeks? Three? Two weeks? Two weeks? Time's flying. So uh, put it in the envelope. Special uh, emphasis: evangelism will go specifically to our church's evangelism effort this spring. Uh, and I think that's all I got. So let's bow our heads for a prayer, and the deacons will take up the offering. Father, we thank you for how much you've blessed us in so many ways, uh, both financially, we're, we're in the richest nation on the planet, um, but also through faith, and we're blessed to be in this church, to have our Sabbath school classes, to have our pastors, and to just have each other, a family for which you are our Father and our God. We ask that you accept our token of gratitude for your love for us this morning, as we give back to you just a small amount of your blessing you've given to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And children's story is next. So kiddos, come on down and uh, pick up the Lamb's Offering, which supports our various youth ministries, children's ministries. How are you today? All right. Well, I have a story I want to share with you, and I have a couple of helpers with me. And so I want you to see what they have in their hand. This is a clear glass of nice, cool water. If you're thirsty, you would drink that. And I'm not sure how thirsty you would have to be to decide to drink this. I hope you would choose not to, because this is actually a lot of dirt and who knows what else and water, okay? But that's part of our story today, okay? So how many of you go to Burleson Adventist School? How many of you guys, okay. So if you go to that school, you heard me tell this story yesterday for chapel, but it's a different lesson that I'm going to share than the lesson I shared yesterday. Same story, different lesson, okay? So let's see who was paying attention. Who was the uh, main character of our story at chapel yesterday? Anybody remember? 
No, good. I, it's first time. I'm telling it for the first time. Okay. I will give you a hint. He was a general of an army. Do you remember now? Naaman. Very good. So we're going to, I want to tell you the story once again about Naaman, but a different lesson today than we shared yesterday, okay? Naaman was a general, and the country that he um, represented, it was called Aram, and he worked under the king of Aram. And Naaman was a successful general, but Naaman had one big problem. Does anyone know with the Bible story, what was Naaman's one big problem? Yes. He had leprosy. That's right. And leprosy was no fun. A really terrible skin disease. And when you have it, nobody wants to be around you. They just, you get ostracized. You get pushed to the side and you're all by yourself and you wish people would hang out with you, but they don't. So Naaman's wife had a servant. And she said to Naaman's wife, hey, Naaman should go to Samaria to see the prophet there, and that prophet can bring him healing. Does anybody remember what the prophet's name is that Naaman would have to go see? What was his name? Cl close, not Ja. Shh. Elisha. Very good. It was Elisha. So... The servant girl said he should go see Elisha down in Samaria. So that's what he does. So he travels. So he got in an airplane. Wait, did he get in an airplane? No, there was no airplanes. So he got in a bus. Wait, did he? Did they have? No. He had that chariot. You know your Bible. You know your Bible. Amen. He got in his chariot and he traveled down to Samaria and he had to first see the king of, uh, of Israel. And the king from Aram gave to um, Naaman a letter and some silver and gold to take to the king. And so Naaman does that, goes to the king, and Naaman then tells the king, here's why I'm here. And the king goes, you need to be healed from leprosy. And you know what the king did? Something interesting. He took his clothes, and what did he do? He ripped them. Have you guys, anyone ever done that? I hope not. Clothes are a lot of money. Don't rip them. But... In the Bible days, that was a tradition when people were uh, sad or in despair. And so he tore his clothes and he said, why would they send you to me? Am I God that I can kill or bring life? I bet your king was just trying to start a fight. But remember, he wasn't there to go see the king. He was there to see which, which prophet? Elisha. So Elisha hears about it and Elisha... This is what's funny. Elisha does not go to see Naaman. Elisha sends a messenger and says, tell Naaman to come see me. So Naaman goes to see him, and Elisha gives him some simple instructions. If you want to be healed from leprosy, what does he have to do? Yes! He has to go into the Jordan River, and he has to dunk how many times? Seven times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, what if he only dunked four times? Would he be healed? No, because when God says seven, what does he mean? He means seven. Now, you know what Naaman did? Naaman was thinking of a river that might look like this. And he was saying, whoa, 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 time out. Why is this guy sending me to a river instead that looks like that? Ugh. Come on now, there's better rivers where I'm from. Why are you doing that? And you know what Naaman did? He, the Bible says he stormed out in rage. But his servants came to him and said, Whoa, 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 Naaman, this is leprosy. You would do anything to get rid of leprosy. Why can't you go into the Jordan? So Naaman, and he goes into the Jordan. Now, does he only dunk one time? No, two times? No, three times? No, four times? No, five times? No, six times? How many times? Seven. And what happened? He was healed. Now, after I shared the story with those at BAS yesterday at chapel, a teacher came up to me and said, you know, as you were talking, I thought of something. And when she shared what she thought of, I said, ooh, what a great idea. So I'm going to share what she shared with me. She said, it would have been nice to be baptized in a river that looked like that. But, name was I'm sorry, not bad, but dunked in a river that looked like that. But he was dunked in a river that looked like this. It was nasty and yucky. You know somebody else we know very famous was baptized in the Jordan River? 
was God. It was Jesus. And you know, she said, I thought about it. Jesus got into this filth, and he didn't just put his feet in and his other foot. He was all the way dunked in, head, nose, chin, everything. He surrounded himself and immersed himself in all that filth, and he came up, and he was baptized. And he goes, you know what? That was symbol, a symbol of what Jesus did his entire life by choosing to become a human and taking on humanity and taking on our sin so that we might be saved and have eternal what? Yes. So I'm thankful that Jesus himself didn't complain like Naaman did. He got right in. John the Baptist dunked him in all that filth. And it was a symbol of him dunking in our sin, immersing himself in our sin, and taking it on so we could be sin free. Is that a beautiful thing? Let's celebrate the rest of the Sabbath with that truth in our heart, okay? All right, you can go back to your seat. Our Father in heaven, we come before you today with joy in our hearts for this very reason that we, can't, that we can come before you. We thank you for Jesus Christ whose precious sacrifice opened the doors for us to be in your presence. As Hebrews says, we can boldly come to your throne and we are so very grateful. We are thankful to come together as a church family and though we come from different backgrounds and different perspectives, we are all in need of the grace of Jesus Christ. And it is the love of Jesus that unites us and it binds us that we are one body and Christ is the head. Lord, you know what is on the hearts and minds of each and every person in this room. And for those who could not be here, you already know. And you are a God of love. And so you are already working on our behalf. And so the challenges that we face, relationship challenges, health challenges, finance challenges, job challenges, school challenges, whatever it may be, Lord, we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. And it is you. And so may our faith be strengthened by putting our trust in you. We ask for your spirit to fill this room as we continue in worship. We ask for your spirit to touch hearts as our upcoming America in Prophecy seminars are near. And we just want people to know the message, the three angels' message that you have blessed this church with, reminding us that your coming is soon and you wish that none should perish. And so may we tell our friends and may we throw away the idea that we ourselves have heard this before. But instead, may we come out and meet Jesus again for the first time. And Father, I ask for your spirit to be on Pastor Ryan. He's a blessed man with a blessed family, and you've blessed him with a great message today. May our hearts and ears be open as we listen and learn and live out what is shared. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, as we all say together, amen. Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you here today. Today we are continuing, and actually next Sabbath, we'll conclude our series, The Lord of the Harvest. Uh, Pastor Chris will bring us the final message in the series next Sabbath. Um, but uh, we are, um, before we fully get rolling into the sermon, I want to do a couple of things. First of all, I want to point you to something in your bulletin. At the top it says, Ways You Can Help. Um, you may have seen this the last two Sabbaths. If you have not, give it a good look through um, just so you know what kind of uh, commitment you might be getting into. 
Uh, we, we have meetings coming up that start Mar March 24, um, a Friday evening, and we are going to go Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night for, for five weekends. Actually, the last weekend, we're dropping off Sunday night, and we'll finish on Saturday night, April 22. All right, so um, I'll point you to this. If there is some way you'd like to help out, if you're volunteering to help with something like greeting or registration or children's program or different things along those lines, um, those things will be as you're available. Um, we, of course, invite you to attend as much as you're able to to kind of help uh, fill in and get to know visitors and make friends with them. But we also um, have a need for some table hosts, just a few more. And if you would be able to commit to Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night uh, for several weekends in a row, uh, we could sure use you as, as a table leader to kind of facilitate a couple of questions each evening as we have our meetings. So um, if you want to fill this out or if you need to talk to me later, that's okay. Be praying on it, thinking about it as we go through uh, the rest of the service today. We're going to pick these up in the offering plate at the end of the service. And I see a volunteer already, so <laughs> you'll preach. All right. I thought you were volunteering for something else, but we'll, we'll try to get, we'll figure that out. We'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> Not, no time for anything else, just preaching. All right. So um, if, if you take a look at that, in addition to that, I want to um, see if our deacons could come around. Uh, so they have a couple of things in their hands. If you're part of a Sabbath school class, you've probably already seen this, but they have a sheet that talks about different ideas for inviting people to the meetings. These folks you've been praying about, people that are on your list. And so they're just going to pass a few of these down each aisle. And uh, when, when they're done, you can just set the rest at the end of the aisle. But they also have some invite cards. And so these invite cards are smaller than the larger handbill, easier to put in somebody's hand. It directs them to the registration website where they can find out more information. Um, and however many you need, our deacons have, have quite a few. We will have more next Sabbath as well because um, we had some folks that needed quite a few. So if we run out next Sabbath, we will have more. And, um, and uh, so we'll, we'll get those to you. One other thing, as they are passing these things out, if you have your phone right now, this is one way you can partner with us in just getting the word out. We have on our church Facebook page... Um, this is the post there, so if you search for Burleson Adventist Church on Facebook, if you're not already connected with us, just give, give the page a like, and, um, and, and you can go, and, and this is the top post uh, at the top of the page. Um, this is uh, basically an advertisement for um, the meetings coming up and lets people know how they can get in, in, involved. Um, they can click that link, actually, and get registered um, directly from this. So if you want to go ahead and share this post just to help get the word out, feel free to do that right now from your phone so you don't forget, and uh, that, that would be a, a huge help. One thing I will tell you about the invitation card that's in your hands right now that looks something like this but a little bit different. Um, the invitation card has a misprint on it. Now, fortunately, it's not address or anything like that, but our children's meetings are going to be for, for ages 3 to 8, not 0 to 8. We do not have a nursery. And so, as you're inviting people, well, 3 to 9, right? They can come if they're 9 to the children's meetings. They can come to the adult meetings if they're 9, either one. So, yeah, yeah, sorry, 3 to 9. If they're 3 years old... They have to have a parent with them, but so four to nine, if, if they are in that age bracket, they can attend without a parent. So as you're inviting people, just keep that in mind. If you know the ages of their kids, just share with them, you know, the, I know what it says on the back here, but here's our setup. In fact, if they wanted to come, maybe even with a one or two-year-old, as long as the parent's there with them, probably isn't going to be very interesting for a one or two-year-old, <laughs> but um, they could maybe come and, and mom and dad could be with them, go in and out as they need to. All right? Does all that make sense? All right. Very good. If you have questions, uh, feel free to ask now. All right. Okay. I want to do something a little different today before we launch into the sermon. You've got invitations in your hands. You know people that you're going to invite would you take maybe three, three or four minutes, turn to someone next to you, would you pray for each other, 
and pray for the people that are on their list. You don't have to necessarily know all the names. Maybe there's a specific situation you have in mind. I just want us to pray for these invite cards, uh, to pray for those people, and to, to be able to do that right now, and uh, then we will k- continue on with the service. So I'm going to give you just a few moments here. Turn to somebody next to you, and just have a, a brief word of prayer for those that you're planning to invite. And Father in heaven, I just want to also pray as the church is finishing up their prayers. I want to pray for each one of them. They've been praying for other people, but I pray, Father, that you would give them courage, that you would give them the words to say and the way to say it as they think about those that they are inviting to the meetings. We pray all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The big questions. The big questions in life. I've got two big questions for you today, and I will share those with you in just a moment. But before I do, I want to I just get your, your, the wheels turning in your mind. Do you realize how big a deal it is, the motivations that we have for why we do what we do? I, uh, I read a story just recently about a man by the name of Bob Kuchenberg. Now, I'm a big football fan, but this guy lived before I was a football fan. And I I think he's still alive, but he is a former Miami Dolphin great. Um, And he once explained his motive behind going to college. As he told the story, his father and his uncle were both a part of a, a traveling circus. And they were both human cannonballs. And so his dad told him, he said, go to college or be a human cannonball. And he says that he contemplated that for a while until one day, his uncle, when he was fired out of the cannonball, missed the net and hit the Ferris wheel instead. And he said, I'm going to college. (laughs) What was his motivation? Not being a human pancake on the side of a Ferris wheel, I don't know. Uh, Something along those lines. That's at least how he shared the story. I have a question for you, and it has to do with motivation. Why are you here? I tried to make the question as big as possible on that slide. (laughs) Big question number one. Why are you here today? You know, I've found that when it comes to motivation, for every good motivation that we find in the Bible for this aspect of church life, there's also a counterfeit that's there. And maybe even more than one counterfeit. We're going to just think some things through here this morning. Motivation. Why are we here today? Let's think first of all about This idea, what brings you to church? Let's think about worship for just a moment. The story of the tax collector and the Pharisee. A parable that Jesus told, Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. You can find it there if you'd like to reread it. What we find there is that who had it right? It was the tax collector, right? The the sinner, the tax collector. Somebody that... Um, understood what worship was all about. It was about a heart experience. It was about his heart being in a right place with God. It was about humility. It was about being bowed down, and it was about realizing and recognizing his need of God. And on the flip side, you remember the Pharisees' experience, don't you? It was all about outward form, and somehow he had gotten the idea that worship was somehow about himself, right? And, and, and so this idea that, that it, was, it was an outward form, he, he, he came, he, and he, he got very close, the other man stood far off, and he was praying, thank you, God, that I'm not like this person over here. Thank you that I'm such a good returner of tithes and offerings to you. And that I do this so well, and I somehow worship for him was self-centered. A, a strange idea, right? But yet, 
a, a, a very clear counterfeit, you know, outward form. We talk about why do you come? Why, why do we come to, to worship? Why do we come to church? Is it possible that sometimes we do it to, so that we don't feel guilty? No, and I, I hope that's not the case. But, but is it possible that sometimes we, we want to appease our conscience or maybe just feel good because we've checked another box there on my spirituality list? I went to church. I'm a churchgoer. How about when it comes to study of Scripture? Why, why are we here? John 5.39, you probably remember that passage, right? That passage where Jesus helps some of the religious leaders of his day to understand that they're missing the boat when it comes to a study of Scripture because he says, you're missing the fact that these same Scriptures testify of me. What are we getting out of our study time at, at church? Are we, are we here to, to, to see Jesus better? To grow in our experience and at the same time find things that we can share with other people? Or are we here to pontificate? <laughs> it, it feels good sometimes to be able to engage in these deep theological discussions and questions that, that come up. Are we here to see Jesus better, to know him more, or are we here to show how much we know? Sometimes we've got to do motive checks on ourselves because we're like, well, I think both sometimes, you know. <laughs> but I wonder if motive matters. How about the preaching? James one twenty two. James tells us how important this, this is here. He says, But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves or deceive themselves, James says in chapter 1, verse 22. Doers of the word and not merely hearers of the word. So I have a question for you. Are we hearing the word and doing what God has laid on our heart as the conviction that comes along with whatever message is for the day, are we not just merely hearers, but also doers of the word? I, I've, I've coined this phrase, uh, some of us get caught up in the conviction addiction. <laughs> Let me describe that to you. Sometimes, and I think this is, is the case across Christianity in, in a lot of ways, but sometimes we, we get so caught up and we want to come and we want to hear a message that stimulates our heart, and we do, and then we're satisfied with the conviction. Instead of saying, God, you are calling me to make some changes, and here's where you're, you're touching my heart, and, and this is what I'm going to do for you today. I'm going to make these changes in my life by your grace and, and by, through your power and, and through the strength of your Holy Spirit. But it's very easy to get caught up in this being addicted to being convicted, but that's all. It stops there. Now, we all enjoy the Holy Spirit moving on our hearts, right? But he moves on our hearts for a purpose. What's he moving on my heart for, for today? How is he trying to, to impact my life and see a change and growth happen in my life? And how about with fellowship? We're going to skip forward here. Fellowship. Building up of the body of Christ. That's one of the beautiful benefits of fellowship. The building up of the body of Christ. In fact, a part of fellowship is everybody working according to their gifts. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that when the spiritual gifts are being used within the church, there's something beautiful that happens. It says that when the saints are doing the work of service, the body of Christ is built up. It says that we grow in the unity of the faith and in our relationship with Jesus Christ to such an extent that we begin to look like the fullness of Christ. That's true fellowship there. The body of Christ is built up. By the way, verses uh, 12 and 13 are what I'm referencing there if you'd like to go and, and read that and study that for yourself. But there's a counterfeit there, isn't there? That fellowship could just become a club meeting. <laughs> and sometimes it could even become clubs within clubs, couldn't it? 
the bigger the church gets, the more groups you have, and there are certain aspects of, 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 of friendship circles within churches that are positive and healthy. But, but there are certain things where if it just becomes a meeting where we're getting together with our friends and talking with them, but nothing more is happening outside of that, especially related to ministry. Um, we have membership, we pay dues, <laughs> normal things that come along with clubs, right? But where is the building up of the body of Christ? Where are those who fall through the cracks? A couple of other things here as we continue thinking. We need to come sometimes for healing, don't we? For encouragement, for strengthening. And the Bible's very clear on that, that this is one of the, the benefits and the blessings of the church. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14 says, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. I don't know about for you, but there are times when I need this blessing from the church. It may not be every week or every Sabbath, but, but there are Sabbaths, and I'm, I'm sure you're in the same boat where you just need strengthening. You need encouraging. You need someone to reach out to you and say, brother, the Lord loves you. He cares for you. I know you're going through a tough time, but sister, the Lord is there. The Holy Spirit will get you through this time. He'll be your comforter, your encourager. We need strengthening, don't we? The counterfeit, though, being a taker. I want to acknowledge and realize there may even be seasons of your life where for a period of time, and maybe even extended period of time, you need those blessings of healing and encouragement and strengthening. So understand what I'm talking about with this idea of being a taker. I don't want you to misunderstand it, but, but if our lives are devoid of the Holy Spirit six days a week and we come to church, what are we going to be craving? I mean, we're going to be craving the next fix if we're just living week to week and Sabbath to Sabbath. What if the Christian church today or even the Seventh-day Adventist church today were filled with people who just need to get there to church so they can get that fix and then... Life is just too busy, and so they don't, they don't have that daily walk. And, and if the, the church were just full of takers. See, two different things here. Needing strengthening and encouragement, and maybe even for a season of your life, and maybe multiple times during your life, right? And maybe those times are, are pretty close together. And on the other hand... Being a taker, it can drain a church. It can drain a church, can't it? It can, it can drain us emotionally and spiritually as the body of Christ. Just like we need healing and encouragement and strengthening sometimes, we also need to come spirit-filled with testimonies to encourage. Some people need encouragement, and others need to be able to come alongside and say, guess what? God is there and he can do for you what you cannot do for yourself. He can bring everything that you need and encourage you. And let me tell you how he's done it for me recently. It's not that I'm better than you, but, but let me tell you what he did for me. And that same God is your God too. But you know, it's interesting. I have heard stories sometimes where you would hardly know that God even worked. <laughs> You might find this hard to believe, but, but I, I, have, I, I, I sat through a seminar one time where a pastor was just trying to get people to praise God for who he is. And, and a couple of times sitting and listening as, as the person could not quit talking about themselves and how much money they had given at, at one point in the past and how the church was so much better off because of them. I, it doesn't happen that often, and you might think it sounds strange, but sometimes that, that is some people's idea of praising God or giving a testimony about all the things that I've done. And yet at the same time, 
God does have a true version of testimony and praise, right? It brings honor and glory to him. We're just the vessel through which things happen. I want to throw this up here for review. Worship, study of scripture, preaching, fellowship. And I have another big question for you. One more big question, that's it. And here it is. Why are you here? You say, that's the same question. (laughs) Yes, it is technically the same question, all right? But, But in a different context, I want you to consider this question. Not why do you come to church, but what is your purpose in life? In other words, on this earth, right now, as a Christian Seventh Day Adventist, at this point in earth's history, Just before the second coming of Jesus, why are you here? What is your purpose? And now, before you answer in your mind, I want to encourage you this. Uh, The answer to the first question has an impact on the second question. And vice versa. The way you answer this question has an impact on why you're here today and why you come week to week, doesn't it? If we truly are embracing God's purpose for our lives right now and identifying with the mission of the church, I think the reasons we come to church on Sabbath mornings might get more exciting. And there might be a more spirit-filled atmosphere in this place and in each church. The way we answer one question impacts the way we answer another question. You know, when I was in the seminary, a youth ministry professor shared a little bit about a couple of different models of youth ministry. And I want want us to think about these for just a moment. Here were the two different models, the castle and the leaven. Models for ministry, and I want you to think even broader, and just in the sense of, um, I guess, maybe a little example or maybe even a little parable in relation to the church, the castle model. You arrange ministry or church as a way to protect people from temptation. You need a solid foundation, you need a high point, you need to remove all the trees, You need to have a great moat around there with some alligators or something in the moat. Something that's going to keep people from swimming across. And you need a drawbridge too, right? Don't want to let anybody out that's inside. Don't want to let anybody inside that's outside. (laughs) And so by doing that, we protect our message. We protect our people. We protect those things that we feel matter most. And then you probably remember the parable Jesus told, right? The kingdom of heaven is like unto the castle with the drawbridge and the great moat. You don't remember that one? (laughs) Neither do I. I I don't remember that one. But there is one about leaven, isn't there? And here's the other aspect of of a model for church or for ministry. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, 13 says, He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. The model of the leaven. Challenging people to transform culture, transform their, their churches by mingling with each other and by encouraging each other, right? By letting the light of Christ shine through us. Letting his light shine through us and transform those whom we are in contact with. How is the final work on this earth going to be finished? A couple of misconceptions here. One is that we should pray for the Holy Spirit to be poured out in the latter rain. And when he does that, we're going to get to work. We're going to be so on fire when he finally pours out his spirit. 
And yet, is that what the Bible teaches? We got to wait for the latter rain to get to work. No, the Bible says you should be working right now. God has given you gifts. He has given his Holy Spirit. And that's the whole purpose of the former rain. God wants us to be at work right now doing whatever it is that the Spirit leads us to do with relationships, with friends, with fellow church members. The second thought that's maybe a misconception here as well is, well, we just need to pray that God will do the work, that he will be the one to carry this work forward, and I'm just going to pray. I can't do much, but I'm going to pray. Now, praying is something, right? But does God want to do all the work himself as we pray for him to do it, and he'll just do the work? And That's not God's plan either, is it? God's plan is for you and me to say, okay, Lord, you have given the Holy Spirit. You've given it for a reason. I'm going to do whatever I can today to unite with you and your power and your strength and your influence to do the work that you've called us to do. What does it mean to have faith in God? You know, James chapter 2 talks about faith in God, doesn't it? Talks about faith in God, and James says... You show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith with my works, right? <laughs> he says faith and works go hand in hand. In fact, some people think that, that Romans and, and Hebrews um, disagree with the book of James. And that when Abraham's talked about in Romans 4 as being a man of faith, and he was justified because he had faith in God. Some people say, see, Abraham was a man of faith. James says, works. Um, Ab Abraham had, had faith and works, right? But, but let me ask you, how did Abraham demonstrate his faith? By obedience, by, by doing something. God said, I want you to get up. Take your family, leave, and, and go to a land, and I'm going to show you that land. Abraham said, I, I believe you, Lord, but I'm going to stay here. Right? Is that how the story goes? I have faith, but I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> no, Abraham said, okay, Lord. And you realize how big the scope was of his family? The Bible talks about his family and all the servants and everybody together with him, 318 people. That's a huge decision for a lot of people in a lot of lives. And Abraham said, Lord, I'm going. I know you have a plan. I don't know exactly how it's all going to turn out or where, you're gonna, uh, where I'm going to land, but I'm going to go out not knowing where I'm going. Faith and action, right? That's true faith. Faith that moves us into action. John 21, verses 3 through 6 Last passage we're going to look at in Scripture. Two quotes that I want to share with you and then a story. All right? John, setting of John, the disciples, they're discouraged. Jesus has not yet ascended to heaven, but they're discouraged. And the Bible says that Peter makes a suggestion. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we also will come with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. You guys remember the story? Now, Jesus also did this at the beginning when he called the disciples who were fishermen, right? And they left their nets and they followed him, even though there were lots of fish and lots of wealth there. They left their nets and they followed Jesus. And Ellen White says that that night, this was on their minds. The first time Jesus had said, oh, just cast out your nets and, and uh, see what you get, you know? 
And so this is on their minds, and, and, and she's talking about that. And in the next breath, here's what she says in Desire of Ages, page 811. It was to bring this scene to their minds, remember back from the beginning when he calls them, and to deepen its impression that he had again performed the miracle. His act was a, a, a renewal of the commission to the disciples. It showed them that the death of their master had not lessened their obligation to do the work that he had assigned them. Though they were to be deprived of his personal companionship and of the means of support by their former employment, the risen Savior would have a care for them. While they were doing his work, he would provide for their needs. And Jesus had a purpose in bidding them cast their net on the right side of the ship. On that side, he stood upon the shore. And he, the, that was the side of faith. If they labored in connection with him, his divine power combining with their human effort, they could not fail of success. Don't you like that? He's asking them to do something. They say, okay, there it goes. And their human effort combined with his divine power was, was sure success. And he was trying to teach them a spiritual lesson. That as they moved forward and they engaged in the work he was calling them to do, their human effort with his divine power, they could not fail. What a beautiful thought, beautiful lesson. I want to share one more thought with you before we close. And that is uh, from the book Ministry of Healing, page 100. You know what the chapter is entitled? Saved to Serve. Oh, we're saved with a purpose in mind, huh? Saved to serve. And here's what it says. Um, two, two slides here. Our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. Let that sink in for just a moment. Our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency of revealing Christ to the world. Does, does God want to involve us in the work? Does he need us? I mean, if he chose to use a different way, he wouldn't need us. But does he need us because this is his chosen means? Absolutely. This is his chosen agency, our testimony to other people. It goes on. We are to acknowledge his grace as made known through the holy men of old. But that which will be most effectual is the testimony of our own experience. We are witnesses for God as we reveal in ourselves the working of a power that is divine. Every individual has a life distinct from all others and an experience differing essentially from theirs. God desires that our praise shall ascend to him marked with our own individuality. These precious acknowledgments to the praise of the glory of his grace, when supported by a Christ-like life, have an irresistible power that works for the salvation of souls. I love the way she puts it. When we have our lives completely submitted to him and we are willing to share what he has done for us, there's an irresistible power, I think it's called the Holy Spirit, that works on people's hearts to bring them to salvation. So this morning I want to end, the Connect card is there on the screen, but I want to end with the story. And uh, as I share with you just a little bit here on the Connect card, Heather, would you come forward? He he I'm inviting Heather Bartlett to come and share a little bit with us. My next step today is um, I want to encourage you to make plans, specific plans, to invite people to the meetings we have coming up. Um, and that God would help you to follow through with those plans, whatever they are. Secondly, to trust God's divine power and the conviction of the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do. All right, I want to encourage you. He Heather um, texted me the other day. Heather just invited someone on her list. In fact, was it the first person you invited, I think? It was. Yeah? Okay, so first person on her list. And I want you to hear a little bit about who she chose and how she chose this person to invite, all right? So she's going to be inviting other folks too, but... 
So uh, what, what led you to choose the person you chose? And tell, tell us a little bit about her experience. You bet. So I met her about five years ago as a uh, co-worker. And we, over the five years, have become friends. Um, and, you know, as you become friends, you start sharing personal things. And so she had shared me some things about her life and um, why she questioned if there really was a God. Mm -hmm. And over, those, over the last five years, she has just decided to be an atheist and that she does not believe in God anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and over those five years, I have had her on my personal prayer list. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've continued, she is the first person on my list. And mm -hmm. every week that those connect cards go out, she is the first person on there for us to pray for. And um, tell me your question again. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about how the Lord moved on your heart to, in, to put her on your list, to invite her. Yes. Yeah. So um, we've been talking about these meetings in Sabbath school. And, um, you know, we were talking about, I think it was last weekend or the weekend before, on ways you can invite people. And it was really interesting. I felt like the Holy Spirit kind of told me. Um, my Sabbath school teacher, Tanya, had talked about sometimes you just have to ask the person to come. Yeah. And so the Holy Spirit kind of, you know, led me in that direction and said, it's time. You just need to ask her. Okay. And how did you do that? What, what plans did you make to try to... Sure. invite her to the meetings. Well, how did that go? Uh, so I invited her to dinner. Um, I did not tell her why I was asking her to dinner. <laughs> and so the first week she actually canceled on me. So I was a little discouraged, but I'm not going to lie. I was very nervous. So I was a little relieved. <laughs> <laughs> but God continued to work on my heart and say, do not you are not going to give up on this girl. And so the ne very next week, sh he said, invite her again. And so I invited her again, and she actually said, I can meet you tonight, but not tomorrow night. And she actually invited me to her home. Okay. And so um, I went to her home. All day I had been praying. I had texted Tanya. I was like, please pray for me because mm. I am sick to my stomach. I don't know that I can even do this. Yeah. <laughs> because every time I've ever talked about God with her, she just shuts me down. Mm -hmm. And so I get to her house. We have dinner. We go through the night. Um, and I am like running out of time. There was a couple of times I tried to bring up conversation. And I just felt like I was getting shut down. But at the very end, we're eating dessert. And under my breath, I just start praying. And I said, God, please, I'm at the end here. And I feel like I know I'm supposed to say something, but I don't know what to say. And so the minute that I prayed that, um, I looked at her and I said, Bianca, I'm going to ask you a question. And I said, but I'm, I'm, I want you, I said, you don't have to answer my question right away. I just want you to think about it. And so she goes, okay. <laughs> and I said, um, I know that you've been on the fence about God for a long time. And she goes, Heather, on the fence. She said, I fell off that fence a long time ago, and I am not on the side you want me to be on. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, with that being said, I want to invite you to these meetings. Yeah. And she said, she, it got awkward for a second. She got real quiet. And then she said, well, you know where I stand, but you give me the dates and I'll come. And Amen. so from there, I've just been praying for continuously. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Let's pray for Bianca. Um, and that night, uh, Heather sent me this text. Hey, Pastor, just wanted to let you know that the very first person on my list of, of prayer is an atheist and has agreed to come to the meetings. I was so scared to ask God, but prayed, that would all, uh, prayed about it all day. God is so good. Um, texted a little bit back and forth with her. Um, let me tell you something. Um, Heather's story, uh, she probably is just about of, as scared of uh, doing what she told you about as she is of getting up here and telling you about it, all right? So um, she, she hesitated, almost didn't come up here, but I said, it's more powerful when someone shares it themselves. Please do. So she was gracious enough to do that. Thank you so much. Um, when we are faithful to God's call and just, hey, Lord, I'm putting myself out there, we will probably get a good amount of rejections, right? And that's okay. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about God knowing who needs and is ready to receive the message that is getting ready to be given, all right? So let's be, be praying for Bianca and uh, for Heather as she continues to go through her list of people she wants to invite. Let's be praying for each other. Um, and again, I'd invite you out. Next Saturday night, 6 o'clock, we're going to be praying together as a church for those who can be here um, and uh, enjoying some time in fellowship together. 
Let's, uh, um, well, let me remind you, our, our altar team will be over here on the side uh, after prayer. If you need uh, some prayer and want to pray for someone else, they'll be there to minister to you. Let's bow our heads as we close. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that even though you've called us to service, you don't call us to go alone. And that as you have asked us to fulfill this great commission and to be a part of preaching the three angels' messages and all of these, these uh, things that you've called us to do that could be pretty, um, pretty scary if, if, if it was just us doing it. We, we thank you, Father, that your spirit goes ahead of us, that your spirit works through us, and your spirit is the one who touches people's hearts and, uh, and convicts them uh, for, for your, your kingdom's sake, Father. And we ask, Father, that as, as our church family goes out into this community and surrounding areas where they live and as they invite folks to the meetings, we pray, Father, that your spirit, who has gone ahead of them, will impact people's hearts and give each one courage to share what's on their heart as they invite folks out. And we pray, Father, that as we work together, um, for a month uh, and, and after that as well, that you, would, uh, that you would give us a special blessing of your spirit, that, uh, that, that no division would be allowed to come with the work that you're trying to do here, and that we would be able to, to uh, work together for your glory and your namesake. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.